Not everybody has loads of disposable income. You can look that up, that's a fact. Recently, the tech media has been obsessed with high-end hardware. First, the AMD Ryzen 7000 series of processors, then the RTX 4090, and finally, Intel's new 13th gen CPUs. I myself am certainly guilty of this as well, as a lot of my recent content has been about new, expensive, hard to find products. But what can I say? Pricey stuff go fast. But it's important to remember that the majority of consumers out there aren't in it to score a top 10 on the Port Royal leaderboard or to max out a 360 hertz monitor. They just wanna be able to put together a reasonable system and fire up some games. With that in mind, I ran a recent poll on Twitter asking people what their budget would be if they had to build a PC today. And the top response was actually super budget less than $700 in total. In fact, more than half of the responses chose a budget option. And that got me thinking about what a build like that should actually look like. So today I have three GPUs in front of me and with a twist, they're from three completely different chip designers. So that is super exciting. We're gonna deep dive on your best option for a budget graphics card in this video. Meet the Silent Wings Pro 4, the latest in the legendary line of silent, high-performing fans from Be Quiet. Available in 120 or 140 millimeter sizes and with a high-speed option, the Silent Wings Pro 4 provide next-level cooling performance for your system using their optimized fan blade design and virtually inaudible operation. And with a 300,000-hour lifespan and five-year warranty, these things are built to last. Check out the link below for more information. What's up guys and gals, my name is Brian and this is the BPS Customs YouTube channel. If you like this kind of content and enjoy seeing hardware reviews, how to's and PC builds with a bit of unsupervised liquid nitrogen overclocking on the side, be sure to hit that subscribe button down below. If you're watching this video on Sunday, tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern, I'll be powering up an OC live stream on the channel, so make sure you tune in for that. So. Like I said in the intro, this is honestly a really exciting video for me to make because it's the first time in the channel's history that I've ever had a head-to-head -head comparison between products from AMD, Nvidia, and Intel. That's right, there are now three dogs in the fight, making your choice just a little bit harder as an end user, but also likely driving competition forward significantly. These video cards, the AMD RX 6400, Nvidia GTX 1630, and Intel A380, represent the best new options under $150 that you can buy today. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't find good deals on objectively better hardware if you were to explore the used market. In fact, I think that the biggest competition to these three right here might be something like a used RX 580 or GTX 1060 for around $100, which are all over eBay as mining companies liquidate all of their inventory following the Ethereum merge. However, for a lot of people, especially those in the market for a budget product or those who are just maybe starting their PC gaming journey, Having a new product with a warranty and customer support far outweighs the few extra FPS you might get from a six-year-old graphics card that might come with a myriad of other issues. And speaking of issues, we might as well just address the blue elephant in the room, the Intel Arc A380. Coming in at about $140 and actually pretty widely available as of the shooting of this video. This little guy was, well, uh, kind of a nightmare to work with. This is Intel's first consumer graphics card release and even with the newest drivers installed, still almost caused me to give up on this video entirely. It took me about two hours of troubleshooting to even get this thing to give me an image on the screen. As Windows refused to recognize it until I booted using the iGPU as a display out, installed the Intel drivers, disabled it, re-enabled it, changed some settings in the motherboard BIOS, flipped it to three different PCIe slots, used HDMI instead of DisplayPort, and finally it just decided to work. Even after going through all of this, the performance was incredibly uneven. As you'll see shortly, the average FPS performance actually topped one of the charts, but none of the games that I tested would qualify as playable. I got stuttering, hitching, complete black screens at times, and 1% low values that made it hard to even watch the benchmark footage. 
F122 was screaming along, but had such severe frame time spikes that while the average performance looks okay on paper, I can't recommend this product to anybody. Its saving grace may be that it had six gigs of VRAM, which is two more than the four gigs in either of the other cards, but still. RDNA 2 has proven to be a huge step up for AMD, and the high-end cards do a great job at matching up frame for frame with comparable products from NVIDIA. But what about low-end models like this RX 6400? Well, first of all, I think it's awesome that in this age of almost egregiously large graphics cards, we can still go out and buy something that fits in a single slot at half height, meaning that you can slot this bad boy into even the smallest of chassis. Unlike the Intel card, it doesn't require supplemental PCIe power, and as you'll see, it actually is the most powerful performer on the table. AMD provided this card for me for this testing, and even though you can get 6400s that look more like the Intel card, I specifically requested this teeny tiny one, as I think it's great that products like this still exist. It has four gigs of GDDR6, which might be borderline for even some 1080p titles, but it still pushes enough horsepower to be viable in a lot of scenarios. It's also the cheapest card out of this bunch at about $120. And finally, we have the GTX 1630 from NVIDIA. The XX30 cards have proven to be quite divisive, as while they now carry the GTX branding associated with gaming, they really aren't on the level of other products with that name. The GTX 1630 price fluctuates, but given enough searching, you could probably find one for $140 to $150, which is odd given that you could get a GTX 1650 for about $30 more, and it's vastly superior. Its saving grace might be that its encoding capabilities and the ability to drive streaming or recording systems due to NVENC are pretty good, but that's a corner case for such a budget item. I will say that NVIDIA's ecosystem and driver package is the best of the bunch, so you do get that benefit, but the mediocre performance here just isn't great. Let's show you what I mean with some awesome and very exciting charts. The first one we'll look at is the power draw of each. The cards are color coded here, blue for Intel, green for Nvidia, and red for AMD, so you'll easily be able to identify each one of them on the next few slides. Despite being a completely unimpressive performer and not using a supplemental power connector, the GTX 1630 draws the most power overall while under load at 74.6 watts. This is just within the PCIe slot spec, which is supposed to cap at 75 watts. Both the Intel and AMD cards here sip power, each drawing less than most CPUs. Next is clock speed, and while it's hard to do direct comparisons here due to the different architectures, manufacturing processes, and core configurations, the Intel A380 actually blazes ahead here, averaging almost 2300 megahertz during the Fermark stress test. Although it doesn't amount to real world performance, it may indicate that with better drivers, we may be able to see actual decent results in the future. The games that I tested are all part of my standard GPU test suite, meaning that you're gonna see titles on here that are all fairly new and entirely GPU bound. It might not be reasonable to buy one of these three budget cards and try to play with max settings in Cyberpunk, but regardless, doing these tests with very demanding titles will give us an appropriate way to compare them without worrying about any CPU bottleneck here. I think more realistically, many purchasers of the RX 6400 or GTX 1630 might want to play some older esports titles or even newer games that are easier to run, like Apex Legends or Overwatch 2. So speaking of Cyberpunk, here's how the three compare at 1080p medium with ray tracing on Ultra. No, 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 I'm just kidding. There's no ray tracing anywhere in this video. The RX 6400 clearly comes out ahead here, and with some minor tweaks to settings, can likely produce a good experience at 1080p in this game. You don't need 120 FPS here to have a good time. Cyberpunk actually looks and plays pretty great at maybe 45 FPS in my experience. F122 was up next with the 6400 again taking the lead at 100 FPS and actually a really great looking smooth gaming experience on medium settings. At 1080p medium, this game looks pretty amazing still. And with that frame rate, I think even cranking up to high would be possible. The A380 hummed along pretty good under most circumstances, but regular huge frame rate dips every few seconds really cratered the result down to last place and an unplayable experience. Guardians of the Galaxy at 1080p medium was up next, and 
Oh no, what happened here? Seven FPS? I, I guess that's what I have written down. Yeah, that's a real number. And the flipbook effect was real with the Intel A380. The 1630 and 6400 were neck and neck otherwise, but this is the second most challenging game in my test suite, so the overall numbers still look pretty low. Dirt 5 is the first time we see Intel actually leveraging its VRAM advantage. As with the other two cards in my test, I got low VRAM warnings upon starting the benchmark. With the Intel card, the game actually ran really smoothly for the first time that I've seen, even though ultimately it's still lost out to the RX 6400. The 1630 brought up the rear. Far Cry 6 was unfortunately the only title that I could not run on medium settings. The game was just utter trash for the two four gigabyte cards in the lineup. Changing to 1080p low enabled the benchmark to run properly and we got some decent scores as a result. 65 FPS for the RX 6400 is actually pretty great and cracking 60 FPS in this kind of title is key for playability. Even with the VRAM advantage, the A380 was last. Borderlands 3 was next up. The A380 crushed this test, at least on paper, winning this chart handily. However, as with many of the other games here, the 1% low has made this an unplayable experience. The RX 6400 came in second, again breaking 60 FPS, and I'm not sure why, but the GTX 1630 really didn't like this game finishing last. I've annotated this slide with the 1% lows just to illustrate how bad the performance of the A380 actually was, even though it looks pretty good. Red Dead Redemption 2 was run on the balanced preset at 1080p, and again, we see the RX 6400 topping the charts. As with Cyberpunk, you don't need an insane frame rate in this game to have a good time. And some minor tweaks here would likely net you a playable experience. And our final test was Assassin's Creed Valhalla, with the GTX 1630 scoring its first real win. 64 FPS here at 1080p medium is pretty impressive, although the other two cards aren't all that far behind. The end result looks like this, with average frame rates across all eight tests, giving the clear win to the RX 6400. The GTX 1630, despite being the most expensive card here, was second, and the A380, well, uh, let's just say this guy is special. So at the sub $150 price point, what are your options? You have the used market, of course. You're getting likely what is a more powerful card but won't have a warranty and might be taking on somebody else's problems or a card that just smells like cigarette smoke or something. Of course, there are deals to be had here, and I've done many videos exploring the pre-owned market, but at $120 for a new GPU, the RX 6400 is actually kind of looking like a snack. It handily outperforms more expensive options from Team Green and Team Blue, and AMD has seemingly ironed out a lot of the driver issues that have plagued them in the past. Not to mention that it's just so good and tiny. So if you are building a computer today, what is your budget? Let me know down below in the comments. I'm curious to see how many people need this kind of information comparing low end products instead of the newest, shiniest Halo releases like the RTX 4090. Also don't forget to hit that like button on the way out. And as always guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.